What's up, everybody? Welcome in. It's season three, episode one, the Sports Hub, right here on SBTV. My name's Alex Strope, alongside Michael Wengen and Jackson Jurek. Gentlemen, it's been a busy few weeks. How are we? I'm good. You know, today is actually the first day of fall, so happy first day of the new season. Oh and it won't be too long before we're in October and we're celebrating Halloween. The leaves are changing, so is our cast here on Sports Hub. Jackson making his debut. What's up, buddy? Um, I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm, I'm living, man. I'm living. I'm excited. It was a big weekend in sports. It's fall, as Michael mentioned. The leaves are changing colors. Everything's so beautiful. Let's talk so about crisp. what you're to see. Exactly. So crisp. On this episode, we're talking pointer sports. The Wisconsin Badgers, the Green Bay Packers, both got huge victories over the weekend. The Brewers are pushing toward the playoffs and the classic buy or sell segment. Leading off with Pointer Sports now, the UW Stevens Point football team lost 38 to 21 on the road this weekend against Dakota State University. The Trojans jumped out to an early 14 to nothing lead halfway through the first quarter of play before the Pointers got on the board with an 11 yard touchdown run by quarterback Matt Ermanski. The game turned into a defensive battle the rest of the first half, which was closed out with a Dakota State field goal. The Trojans would then run away with the game after a pair of rushing touchdowns in the third quarter. The Pointers scored two touchdowns themselves in the fourth, but the comeback effort was too late. Despite throwing for 268 yards and a touchdown, wait on this, Ermanski threw not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, six interceptions on the day, and the Pointers' rushing attack was held to only 44 yards. Uh, outside of the obvious, guys, we'll start with you, Mike. What the heck went wrong for the Pointers? A lot of things. Obviously, you know, turnovers are killers. Six times you, you throw an interception during the game, and, uh, uh, you know, the run, running attack of Jahai Stigal and Samaje Williams only put together 44 rushing yards. They, although together, although separately, individually, I believe they had 38 and 36 yards respectively, but Ermanski rushed for a loss of 30 yards as well during the game. Help. So it was a very, very tough day uh, in Dakota, at Dakota State overall for Ermanski. It's just the lack of offensive production pretty much overall. A, a week after where they scored 31 points over the then 21th ranked Abs Wabash College. Absolutely disappeared. It absolutely went right out the window in Dakota State. Ermanski threw three touchdowns and had no interceptions on the season before going into Saturday's game. Now all of a sudden has six interceptions this season. Not a, not a great look so far. You understand the circumstances that Ermanski is now the starter for this pointers offense with Max Harrow's season-ending injury. So right. I think he's still trying to find his rhythm a little bit, but it's going to be a bit of a challenge now as they get ready for conference play in a couple weeks. Just when you thought he had that rhythm you bring out, all of a sudden it disappears with, again, six freaking interceptions. That's a lot. I'm sorry, Matt. I'm sorry. Jackson, break this down for me. Well, you look at it. I spoke to Coach earlier last week, and he said, you know, we're focusing on the Wabash game and zero interceptions there, zero turnovers. That's exactly what they needed to do in their game against Wabash, and that's exactly what they did, and that's why they won that game. And the reason they lost this game against Dakota State is because of the six interceptions. You look at it, they were close. They had a chance to win that game and come back, but Matt throwing those interceptions cost his team, and it cost the team not being able to run the ball. They were all focused on the passing game, and that's probably why they had six interceptions, and the run game just wasn't there. So not being able to have that one-two punch of the run game and the passing game like they did in Wabash, they just didn't have it. So break this down for me. How do you turn this around, Jackson, when, you, when you're coming off such a big win? Number 21 Wabash goes down, you're at home, home opener, big win. You go on the road and just offense just disappears like we've been saying. How do you turn this around now? Simplicity. Yeah. One word is simplify your game. Don't overdo anything. Simplify the run game. Simplify the pass game. Get down to what you guys did well against Wabash, what you guys did well against your first game. You didn't lose that bad in your first game. You arguably could have had a chance to win that game. Yeah. I think they were 2-5 mm -hmm. and five in the red zone. And they had a very good chance of winning that game, and they won their Wabash game. And then they come into Dakota State, and they just look terrible. So simplify your game, simplify the run game, simplify the offense, and your defense is going to follow, and you guys can have a great season in conference play. And it starts up soon. The Pointers now 1-2 and two on the season are off this weekend before starting conference play the opening weekend of October. Moving on now, the Pointers volleyball team took two out of three matches this weekend in the second Pointer Invitational of the season. 
On Friday, the Pointers defeated North Park University in three sets as senior April Gale recorded her eighth consecutive double-double of the season with 13 and 13. On Saturday, the Pointers split a pair of matches as they won against Milliken University in three sets, but fell to the University of St. Thomas in a great game, five sets in that one. Gale recorded a double-double in each match and currently leads the nation, no shocker here, in total kills. Uh, guys, talk to me. This team has been really, really good. Young, now they've got a lot of seniors on this squad. Mike, we'll start with you. Overall thoughts on this Pointers Volleyball squad? I think they've been kind of playing with a lot of chemistry this year. Obviously, this is the first full year now for head coach Lindsey Coy after she had the interim tag removed yeah. during the offseason last year. And she kind of like uh, mentioned this in, their, in a story that was done by a sports reporter, Rachel Ellis, that uh, she talked about that this is her team now. This is her home. This is the players that she has had in her program now. This is her first freshman recruiting class yeah. that she has had as a head coach now. And of course, you got to give the credit to the players out on the floor. April Gale, obviously Eventually. a phenomenal player, was named an AHDA All-American last year. Uh, WIAC player honors, or WIAC conference honors, excuse me. And then of course, um, a little bit of credit as well to another upperclassman, Ellie Adams as well, yeah. who's also been Great. like the number two player out there on the floor. So a lot of the chemistry up by this Pointers volleyball team has carried them so far to double digit wins and only under five losses so far in the season. Yes, they've been pretty darn good, no lie. April Gale, as mentioned, we've talked about her on this program just about every show times, in the last yeah. four years. Yeah, she's been uh, that darn good. Uh, Jackson, I mean, obviously tough losses. St. Thomas, a ranked opponent, and barely falling to them. So you've got to like what you're seeing. Yeah, uh, St. Thomas, a very good volleyball team. You can give credit where credit is due to them, but you also got to give credit to our Stevens Point Pointers. They played phenomenal against them, a tough Mayak team over in Minnesota. And April Gill going in and playing phenomenal, leading their team to a five-set tough loss, 15-13 game. And you just got to build off that. Exactly. Just continue yeah. to grow, continue to build that chemistry that you were talking about. And the pointers are only going to get better. It's all uphill from here with April Gill leading the way on their team. And coming into WIAC play, it's going to be scary. If you are anyone else in our conference, mm -hmm. you better watch out for the pointers. He's, he's showing his pointer pride with that tie in over there. Great the tie. <laughs> the team currently 13 and 4, as Mike mentioned on the season. They look to continue their success as they host UW Stout in conference play on Wednesday. We're going to take our first time out on the other side. We're talking Badgers, Packers. Those were victories on the gridiron this weekend. This is the Sports Hub on SB TV. I just wanted to get good grades and to do well. But it also made me realize that I have a lot of career goals. You're there to get a full college experience, not only participate in your sport, but participate in things outside of that. And it's all about growing as a person. My coaches have helped me with figuring out who I really am. Their lives are dedicated for us to succeed. Welcome back into the sports of the 13th ranked Wisconsin Badgers took down the 11th ranked Michigan Wolverines 35 to 14 on Saturday at Camp Randall in Madison. In the first quarter, Badgers running back Jonathan Taylor started the scoring for the Badgers. Two rushing touchdowns in the first with the second being a 72 yard carry. Junior quarterback Jack Cohn contributed to the ground attack as well, rushing for a pair of touchdowns in the second quarter. Sophomore fullback John Chanel also scored for, a, or also rushed for a score, excuse me, in the third quarter to make it 35 to nothing in the win. Cohn completed 13 of 16 passes for 128 yards, and Taylor rushed for a whopping 203 yards with a pair of touchdowns. Guys, we should mention when they got off to that 35 to nothing start, they were outscoring opponents on the year 145 to zero before Michigan scored uh, late in the game. So 
I, just, I mean, we might as well over-exaggerate here on a Monday. Are the Badgers the favorite to win the Big Ten? Right now, yes. But there are a lot of teams in the Big Ten yeah. Conference that are good. You look at Iowa. They went down to Iowa State, or up, excuse me, and beat them in their division. They get in a great Cyhawk game. I was there. It was amazing. But they walk into there, and they pull away with a tight win. Then you look at Penn State, another great yeah. football team. And you look almost, not everywhere, but there's a lot of tough teams where Wisconsin can fall, but there are also a lot of tough teams that Wisconsin can beat and look past that and win the Big Ten, in my opinion. And, of course, you, you mentioned all those teams, Iowa, Penn State. you got to, of course, always mention, too, Ohio State. They're going to be competitive every year, even though Urban Meyer is no longer the head coach at Ohio State. They're obviously considered, considered favorites to win still oh, yeah. right now at the moment. But you got to look at this Badgers team overall, and as you mentioned, 148? 145 to 145 zero points yeah. uh, through 10 quarters on the season before they finally gave up a touchdown in the third quarter to, to the Wolverines, but just phenomenal overall. You got to even look at Jonathan Taylor, and you know he has to be considered a Heisman candidate at this point oh, right now. It, it's still, th still running the season. We've only played four weeks of college football right now, but again, the, the Badgers do have a little bit of a tough schedule coming up as well. They got uh, teams in the West Division that probably could be a little bit of a sleeper. They, um, I mean, no, Northwestern will be on the schedule this w upcoming weekend, but Michigan State as well it could be a potential yeah. team that they might have to yeah. play hard against. And, of course, later on in November, I believe, they have to go to Ohio State, which October will be the 26th. ultimate test for this Badgers football squad. You, you mentioned it, Michael. You mentioned it. I mean, there is never an easy game in the Big Ten. Northwestern no. maybe as easy as you're going to get the, maybe the rest of the way, but you talk about Iowa, Michigan State, Ohio State all on the schedule uh, within the next month and a half. So the Badgers got a lockdown, but Taylor definitely a Heisman uh, favor, definitely. has to be yeah. right now. Badgers, as mentioned, remain undefeated, now ranked eighth in the AP poll. They cracked the top 10 finally. And as Mike mentioned, Northwestern on Saturday in Madison. Uh, football weekend in Wisconsin wrapped up on Sunday. The Green Bay Packers defeating the Denver Broncos 27 to 16 on Sunday at Lambeau Field. For the second week in a row, the Packers scored a touchdown on their opening drive only three minutes into the ball game. The Broncos would respond with a touchdown of their own to tie the game up at seven apiece. The two teams would be neck and neck until the Packers scored late in the second quarter to go up 17 to 10 at the half. Green Bay would score then early in the third quarter after a Broncos fumble and they never let off the gas as they held the Broncos to only one touchdown in the second half. Aaron Rodgers completed 17 passes for 235 and a touchdown, while Marquez Valdez-Scantling made six receptions for a game-high 99 yards and a score. Despite only rushing for 19 yards on 10 carries, Aaron Jones still had a pair of tutties on his own. So guys, you've got to be impressed with what the Packers did against the Broncos on Sunday, now 3-0 on the year. Yeah, and you know, I didn't mention this too, but uh, you know, the defense on the day had six sacks on yeah. Joe on Broncos quarterback and Joe three Flacco turnovers. and three turnovers. And they did, uh, the offensive line kept Aaron Rodgers with a lot of protection, even despite having a lot of uh, blitz and pass rush from uh, guys such as Von Miller. So I was very impressed by this Packers team overall. They did kind of have a few hiccups there in the in the second quarter towards the end of the first half, but um, off. A Broncos fumble, they scored two touch, uh, two Broncos fumbles actually, excuse me, they scored two touchdowns off the legs of Aaron Jones and Rodgers opened up with that big 40 yard touchdown pass to Valdez Scantling there almost three minutes into the first quarter. So I was very impressed by how fast this team got off to a good start, but it kind of was a little bit of a repeat from the week before when they played against the Vikings. They kind of hit a little bit of a roadblock there. Uh, kind of maybe took their foot off the gas a little bit, but their defense is keeping them in, in these games. And oh, why? If, uh, if the defense is able to do that, the defense is having a lot of fun too on the season so far. The defense can keep you in ball games and allow you to have a chance to open up the scoring a little bit, then I'd say your team is looking very, very good. Yeah, Jackson, what stood out to you? You think of the Packers, you think of Aaron Rodgers. You're right. This mm -hmm. year, it's not Aaron Rodgers. It is their defense, yeah. and their defense is probably second to only the Buffalo Bills. And that is something mm -hmm. that, if I am a Packers fan, I'm proud of. Because 
You think of the Packers, you think of a high scoring team that's going to go out there and put up 35, but this defense, they're going to shut you down. They're going to beat you pass protection, they're going to beat you blitz, and they're going to beat you everywhere. And not only is their defense good, but Aaron Jones is helping Aaron Rodgers so then that way he can beat you deep. He can take you 40, 50 yards, and next thing you know, you're beat, you're burnt. And Aaron Jones is helping them spread out their game, and the Packers are arguably the team to beat in the NFC North and maybe even in the NFC after all these injuries have gone down. Jackson, make the case to the naysayers. Obviously a not great slate of quarterbacks the Packers defense has seen so far. Kirk Cousins, Mitch Trubisky, and on Sunday it was Joe Flacco. Uh, maybe not the greatest quarterback competition, but you're, saying, there's, you're saying second best defense maybe so far this year. Tell me why. Why? The Vikings O-line is a very good O-line this year sure. compared to last year. They pressured Kirk Cousins. They pressured him into turning that ball over, throwing passes or throwing interceptions that shouldn't even be attempted. They are getting to the quarterbacks with teams that have great O-lines and they're pressuring them. And coming into this weekend, or this week, excuse me, against Philadelphia, a, a tough opponent, a tough opponent comparing them to their three previous. So it'll be real interesting to see if they can pressure Carson Wentz into that Philly offensive line and to that Philly offense and see if their defense can really hold up against arguably a better quarterback than what they've seen the last three weeks. Yeah, and you, you got to give credit to the, the free agency additions that have been a huge impact so far. This, the Smith brothers, Darius and Preston yeah. Smith. Uh, Adrian Amos, even though he kind of has been a little bit quieter these past couple of games, he had a big play, a big performance against the Bears, but also the rookies too. You see the chemistry between the, the veterans and the rookies on the defense. Yeah. Rashawn Gary is making some big moves on Finally defense. Finally had a breakout game. Week Finally three. had a breakout game. Darnell Savage had a pick himself during the game. Uh, I think it's just the chemistry with how much different the defense is from previous years with the chemistry. They're, they're having a lot of fun. You see like the celebrations they do after they make a big yeah. play or make, yeah. get a turnover. Like They're having fun. The culture in Green Bay has changed overall too, and I think that's for the better. Jackson, we'll start with you. Last thing on this one. Uh, through three games, who has impressed you the most uh, individually for the Packers? Individually, probably Aaron Jones. Not going to lie. That guy has just, like I said earlier, you think of Aaron Rodgers, but now it's the Aaron Jones era. Yeah. And that's something that the rest of the league probably hasn't noticed yet, but give it a couple weeks and you're going to be hearing about him more and more. Absolutely. Mike? I got to go with the sophomore wideout, Marquez Valdez Scantling, has really stepped up as a number two guy for the Packers. And uh, of course, with the, um, with the way that uh, Randall Cobb left the organization and um, just also with Equinemi St. Brown going down on the year with an injury himself, Valdez Scantling has proven to be the number two wideout, has a lot more experience now, and Rodgers is a lot more comfortable throwing him to him now this season than he did last year when he struggled a little bit yeah. in the first few games of the season. Right. I'm going to go from the field to actually the sideline. I got to go with Mike Pettin, the, the second year defensive coordinator for uh, these Very Packers. True. He has been absolutely, I, I don't even know, immeasurable how valuable uh, his defense has been. That's the reason they're 3-0 and for the first time since 2015. The Packers host the Philadelphia Eagles this Thursday for their third consecutive home game. Uh, this season. It's been an interesting year on the schedule. Interesting. We're going to take one final time out. On the way back, we'll talk Milwaukee Brewers postseason chances, and of course, we'll do a little cha-ching, buy or sell on the other side. UW-Stevens Point is home. It's a university where professors know your name and get you involved in research. They inspire us to realize big dreams. At UW-Stevens Point, sustainability is what we stand for. Our beautiful campus encourages exploration, developing new fields, and problem solving for the real world. It's a great place to launch your career. UW-Stevens Point is home. Apply today at uwsp.edu. College has given me the flexibility to pursue my passions and my interests, and I've recreated my identity for myself aside from just being an athlete. My greatest personal discovery has been that I am capable of doing things that I didn't know I was capable of doing. To be able to study what I wanted to and continue to play the sport I love, all of those things came together very nicely in one package in Division Three. 
Welcome back into the Sports Hub right here on SBTV. Got to jump into a final few things before we take off for the day. The Milwaukee Brewers currently second in the NL wild card race with a four game lead over the Chicago Cubs. You can fly that out. There are also three games behind the St. Louis Cardinals in the NL Central who have now clinched the NL Central. As the league enters its final week of the season, guys, I'll start with you, Jackson. Do the Brewers go back to the postseason for the second straight year? Just give me a yes or no. Yes. Why? You look at the remaining opponents, the Cincinnati Reds, Colorado Rockies. They can beat them, yep. plain and simple. The problem with the Brewers is when they get to the playoffs, because they will, and I believe they will, they need to get home field advantage against the Washington Nationals because you're going to go probably up against Max Scherzer, who is, as we know, unbelievable. Yeah. So you're going to want that home field advantage. And this upcoming week, they need to win out, or at least they need to win five out of six. They need to play their best ball right now. And in the month of September, that's what they've been doing. They're 17 and four right now. It's been unreal if you're a Brewers fan. And the sky's the limit for them. If I'm a guy or a coach in the NL, I do not want to face the Brewers right now. They are hot. So for them, they need to win out. They need to get home field advantage. And I believe that if they can do that, they can make a deep run. Yeah, I'm wondering too how many people exactly wrote off this Brewers team after Christian Yelich suffered a season ending injury, which is very unfortunate. I definitely had probably a possibility of winning his second consecutive NL MVP this yeah, season. Good shot. Good shot. Yeah, had a good shot, but now unfortunately we'll be watching the Brewers from the dugout, uh, which I believe they will make the playoffs uh, as they get rolling into the end of September and into October. They will be playing October baseball for a second straight year, I, I'm pretty sure of it. Uh, of course, though, you know, you take a look, they have a two, three game series left on the season. They have to play uh, division rivals Cincinnati. And then, of course, you finish off the season out at the mile high against the Rockies. Both teams who don't really have anything really to play no. for, but they have a chance to play a little spoiler. And that's the thing, you know, as you mentioned, Jackson, they need to win out or at least win five out of the six games and hope that whoever Chicago is playing during the last week of the season as well can play some spoiler as well and pretty much solidify the Brewers' chances of getting back to the postseason. And uh, even though you said that the St. Louis Cardinals have clinched the NL Central, I still believe that the Brewers and Cardinals could meet if the Brewers were to win the wild card yeah. to play each other in the NLCS. I mean, a, well, a, NLDS, I should right. say, excuse me. That would be quite the, uh, quite the series, but we'll see. I, I, I think, obviously, we know how big this weekend sweep of the Pirates was. Uh, as oh, it was Wisconsin huge. didn't lose a game this weekend. The Badgers won, the Packers won, the Brewers swept. It was a great weekend to be a Wisconsin sports fan. But that said, they jumped up a huge lead. Four games now over the Cubs with only a few games left. You have to imagine they'll be able to hang on. They'll be able to hang on for a wild card spot. And then as, uh, as Jackson said, if it's the Nationals, you got to hope uh, they can bring the bats without Christian Yelich. Uh, that seemed to have really rallied this team after mm -hmm. Christian Yelich went down and they've been playing some great baseball. I'm still worried. I don't think their bullpen has what it takes to get as far as they did last year, but it's October. Uh, anything can happen. We will see. The path will be an interesting one, as mentioned, as the Brewers are on the road uh, for their final two series when they take on, as mentioned, the Reds and the Rockies of Colorado. So guys, let's, uh, let's have some fun now. Let's wrap this up with a little buy or sell. First, let's start with uh, Antonio Brown. Where do we even start? Antonio Brown, let's say he will never play in the NFL again. Buy or sell? I'd buy that. Uh, I, I think he's been too much of a head case. I mean, you want to argue that maybe he's probably had injuries, numerous injuries to the head that has made him kind of be the person that he is. You know, CTE might be a, a factor in it or something like that. But I, I'm thinking that the, it's he's ruined his career enough. Or he, I wouldn't say ruined, but he's wrecked his career reputation enough to the point where teams are going to want to stay away from him he's a total head case it it'd be like almost like another to of some sort but to actually cared about football whereas ab is just i don't know what ab's deal is to be honest so i'm going to buy that, that he's, he's very misunderstood Jackson. yeah i'm going to buy it the guy needs help plain and simple yeah. he has problems that are up in his head and he should not be playing in the nfl nor will he ever play again Ooh. So it's tough for me. I'm going to sell it, I think. I still think he has a shot. I don't know how good of one, but I'm not ready to buy that quite yet. Uh, he re-enrolled in classes at Central Michigan on Monday. I don't know if you guys saw this at all. 
Uh, but apparently he's going back to school for a little bit, so we'll see, uh, we'll see how that happens. He's doing something. He's doing something. He always is, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, question number two, Jim Harbaugh, is he coaching his final season at Michigan? Let's say he is coaching his final season at Michigan. Buy or sell? Um, I'm going to buy it. I really? think that Michigan has and has that football, football reputation of we should be in the top four. We are capable of winning the Big Ten. We are that team to beat from our conference. And lately, they're just not that team. You know, like we said earlier in the show, it's not Michigan anymore. It's Ohio State. It's Iowa. It's the Badgers. It's, you know, it's not the Wolverines that we used to know. And I think that Harbro is not going to be here next year or be there for that sake. Michigan got their fans really excited when they were hiring Jim Harbaugh. That he was going to come in, uh, alumnus leading the program to a Big Ten title and potentially even a chance to play in the college football playoff for a national championship. But it's been utter disappointment so far for Harbaugh and for all of the Michigan program itself. Uh, I, I think that there's only so much that they can take more of Harbaugh this season. And if Michigan continues to falter against especially some uh, some tough East opponents such as Penn State and Ohio State and even Michigan State, their in-state rival. I think Harbaugh's time at Michigan it will officially come to an end. So I'm going to buy this, but I want a warranty on it. Now here's what I mean by that. I'm going to buy that this is Harbaugh's final season if he loses to Ohio State. If Michigan can bounce back and finally do what they're never able to do, and that is beat Ohio State, I think he gets another year at least. However, with this loss at Wisconsin, that doesn't help his case because they're already pissed at him. Not a good game, or not a good showings in the first two games of the year. Now they fall in week three. What do you do with that? So now that they can somehow rebound, do what Harbaugh has not been able to do through his first four seasons and beat Ohio State, I think he gets another shot. Uh, let's go next to the Packers. Do you think they remain undefeated through the first five games? We mentioned this week is uh, at home against the Eagles. Week five is on the road in Jerry's world against the Cowboys. Can they go 5-0, and oh, Jackson? We'll start with you. I'm going to have to say I'm going to sell it. Okay. They're going to go 4-1. and one. They are a great team, but they're not going to beat Dallas. That's uh, where the first loss comes. Uh, their, mm -hmm. first, their first loss isn't going to come this Thursday night at home. They're going to absolutely destroy the Eagles, okay. in my opinion. They're going to lose against the Cowboys. The Cowboys have a great team. Dak Prescott and Amari Cooper are both playing for a huge paycheck right now. So they're going to continue to build off of what they've done so far in the start of this NFL season. And the Packers are going to go 4-1, and one, but they're still probably the team to beat, in my mind, in the NFC North. I'll make my analysis a little quicker. Uh, Dallas has not played any strong opponents so far this season. They played the Giants, the Redskins, and the Dolphins within the first three weeks of the season. All teams that have had losing records so far, especially uh, with <laughs> how bad Miami has been. So I'm not very impressed at all, really, by Dallas so far. I feel it's going to be a great game, though, between these two teams. We'll be down in Dallas. You know that game's going to be almost – it's going to be nationally televised. Joe Buck and Troy Aiken will be on the call for that one. So I have a feeling that they're still going to get it done there in Dallas because uh, Green Bay has actually never lost a game down in Jerry World yet. Really? Yeah. The new stadium. The new stadium, I, sh I should say that. They, they have win. not lost a game at, at Jerry World yet. They, they did win a Super Bowl there, too, if, we're, if we uh, don't want to forget about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to go with Jackson's side. I think I'm going to sell that, but I, th I think they beat Dallas in Dallas. I think they lose to Philadelphia, who is without their top two wide receivers on Thursday, off a short week, but they look horrible. And we all yeah. know that Philly should be the favorite in the NFC East. I think they come back, rebound, win a big game in Lambeau on Thursday. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but that's my early week uh, prediction, so we'll see. That is all the time we have for today's show. I'd like to thank Mike and Jackson for joining me. A uh, huge thank you to our technical staff. You guys freaking rock, as their uh, help does make this show possible. Be sure to check us out on Facebook at SBTV-UWSP Television. You can get us on the gram at SBTV underscore UWSP. We also now have an SBTV Sports Twitter page. That's at SBTV UWSP underscore sports for more content. And lastly, you can check out the UWSP athletics page for more information on everything's pointers. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week on The Hub.